Hello, welcome to today's webinar, Physical Therapy and MG. I'm Jenna Mvalo, and I'll be moderating today's session. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping items. This session will be recorded and available to view after the session on YouTube. Um, if you have any questions, please write them in the Q&A box located at the bottom of the Zoom menu, and we'll get to them during the Q&A se segment. Now, I'd like to take a minute to thank our sponsors, our national presenting sponsors, Alexion, Argenix, Johnson & Johnson, national collaborators, Amgen, and then our national sponsors, UCB, Roche, and EMD, Serono. We've got a great presentation, and now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Christina Chrisman. Welcome. Thank you. Let me go ahead and make sure I can uh, pull my slides up here. Great. All right, everyone, thank you for joining me. Thanks to Jenna for introducing me. Um, our topic today is physical therapy in myasthenia gravis. Uh, my name is Christina Chrisman. I'm a, a neurologist, neuromuscular specialist. I'm at Banner University Medical Center, Phoenix, and University of Arizona. I'm an associate professor of neurology. I'm also director of the neuromuscular and EMG department. So all that being said, I'm not a physical therapist, so I wanted to preface um, this talk with that fact. However, I get this question a lot from patients with myasthenia gravis. Um, what about physical therapy? What about exercise? Is that safe? Is it going to be harmful? So I really wanted to take the time to, um, one, research this. I learned a lot by developing this presentation as well to kind of talk to you about what is the data that's out there? What do we understand? What do we not know? And I think it's a really interesting and helpful topic. Uh, this topic is mostly geared toward patients. I know patients who are involved with and researching uh, MGFA uh, tend to be um, very, uh, very educated and very involved. So this is at kind of a higher level for patients. Um, and then also if there's any healthcare professionals uh, viewing as well, I think you'll also find this beneficial. So here are our objectives today. One is to understand how myasthenia gravis and deconditioning affects physical abilities. Understand how myasthenia gravis is different from other neuromuscular diseases from a physical therapy aspect. So for example, for some neuromuscular diseases, we actually do have evidence that strenuous exercise and activity can be detrimental for, for the long-term, but myasthenia gravis is actually different from other neuromuscular diseases in that aspect, and we'll learn about that. So we'll review what does the actual literature evidence say on physical therapy in myasthenia gravis, and then finally, to understand what may work best for a PT, an exercise plan for you, or if you're a healthcare professional for your MG patients. So we'll start with the basics. I know people um, that are diagnosed with myasthenia gravis have heard this many times and are um, very familiar with this, but I did want to start with this to formulate a background and to show um, how this uh, these things are unique about myasthenia gravis and plays a role in exercise. So uh, as a refresher, we have a neuromuscular junction shown here on the left. Uh, we all know that uh, the acetylcholine gets released into the neuromuscular junction when your nerve wants to communicate in your muscle. And when you have myasthenia gravis, uh, the signal is basically blocked by a variety of different mechanisms that's caused by these harmful autoimmune antibodies that are acting at that site. So because of the way uh, this mechanism happens, we know that the weakness in myasthenia gravis gets worse with more activity, worse later in the day, because the more of that acetylcholine gets used up, then the more apparent the deficits of the neuromuscular transmission are. And we know that it leads to weakness, but weakness that can be in various parts of the body. So uh, it can involve speech, uh, bulbar muscles we refer to. So 
manifesting as slurred speech, trouble chewing, swallowing, droopy eyelids, double vision, weakness of eye closure, difficulty holding up the head. Diaphragm weakness is a big one leading to shortness of breath and then weakness in the arms or weakness in the legs, and usually proximal weakness, like overhead activities, lifting up your arms or uh, getting up out of a chair. So with that background, and as you know, the weakness in my senior gravis is known to get worse with repetitive muscle use. So could that cause us a problem when we're looking at whether or not to exercise? The other side of that coin is, well, if muscle weakness is the main problem, can we build our muscles to be stronger? And can that actually help with strength? Because then we would counteract the loss of muscle tissue. So kind of two different theories on what may be going on in myasthenia gravis and exercise. And then an, another um, question, as I mentioned, can permanent harm be caused? by exercising, if you have a diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. Well, we know exercise is just beneficial for everyone. Um, it's really important for cardiovascular um, health. We know that 30 minutes of aerobic activity at 50 to 80% of your maximum oxygen uptake, also known as the VO2 max, increases your cardiac output, improves oxygen delivery, and actually enhances the ability of your skeletal muscle to use that oxygen. Because your skeletal muscle mitochondria, which are known as the powerhouse of the cell, they actually adapt in people that are well-trained with aerobic activity to make your muscles more efficient. We know that having a better VO2 max leads to better exercise endurance. So it's a, um, it's a, uh, a, a circle of um, improvements, basically. Um, you try to inc increase your um, oxygen activity, then your baseline VO2 uh, max increases, and then uh, over time, exercise gets easier. So less fatigue. We know that strength training increases your lean body mass and muscles can adapt at a cellular level with strength training that can lead to the ability for, of those muscles to have a greater force to be able to contract. So how strength training typically works is that we are actually causing microscopic damage to our muscle cells. That's what we want to happen to a certain degree. And then as those muscle cells are healing, they increase gene transcription, uh, increase um, the development of muscle proteins, and then the muscles hypertrophy or actually get bigger with um, strength training. What then about the risks to exercise in neuromuscular disease? So it has been postulated that a weak muscle is more susceptible to overwork damage. So a muscle that's already functioning close to its maximal limits might be easier to overwork and then damage. Like we said, in strength training, we usually want to cause a little bit of this microscopic injury, but we don't want to overwork. Highly repetitive, heavy resistance exercise, we're talking about very strenuous, that can cause prolonged muscle Prolong loss of muscle strength in a weakened or denervated muscle. But typically what we mean by denervated are certain muscle and nerve diseases that can permanently affect the muscle. So in myasthenia gravis, the problem is not necessarily the muscle itself or the nerve itself, it's just the communication between the two. So this statement really is applicable to things like severe muscular dystrophies, like ones that have a lot of inflammation and muscle destruction, say Duchenne's muscular dystrophy in children, for example, or in ALS, where we know the nerves that are going to the muscle tend to be heavily damaged. So in abnormal muscle, 
like those situations, there is a shift in the normal balance between injury and repair. And you do have to be cautious about strenuous activity, but does not apply necessarily to neuromuscular junction. So there can be things that are barriers to exercise in patients with neuromuscular disease. One is lack of exercise. So if you already are somewhat sedentary, that can actually make it harder for you to get exercising because lack of exercise leads to de deconditioning, deconditioning of your muscle and your cardiovascular um, health. And that creates a vicious cycle. Because then when you're sedentary, you don't have as much calorie expenditure and people may gain weight up to 26%, uh, may have a lean muscle deficit of up to 25%. So not only are you not losing fat that might need to um, reduce, but not building muscle that you need to be healthy. And so that uh, combination of things affects ability to walk and stand safely, which is another barrier perhaps to exercise. And then what about diaphragmatic weakness? So if it's already hard for you to breathe, that could be a barrier for you to be able to exercise. Well, in conditions like ALS um, and certain muscular dystrophies, like I mentioned previously, the muscle itself is damaged. Like if you look at the tissue under a microscope, for example, muscle cells are um, not healthy. And so that weakness in those conditions is permanent. But in myasthenic gravis, that weakness is transient. So you'll see as I uh, go through this presentation, that might be something when myasthenia gravis we can overcome. What about cardiomyopathy, uh, heart failure, arrhythmias? Yes, if your heart is not healthy, that can also be a barrier to exercise. But as a manifestation of neuromuscular disease, that's not seen in myasthenia gravis. There are certain muscular dystrophies where that plays a role. Not in this situation. Of course, if you have heart condition due to something else, um, that would be a potential barrier to exercise and um, a reason to discuss with your doctor would save. And then pain itself. Um, so if you're in pain, of course, that can be difficult to start exercising, but being sedentary can be painful as well. So prolonged sitting and if you're weak, you can actually develop contractures and that's um, where joints may get um, very tight due to the weakness because uh, over time actually uh, tendons and ligaments can get shorter and that's what a contracture is. And that's uh, harder to um, get out of, but can be overcome somewhat with stretching and physical therapy. So let's get into what the evidence actually shows for physical therapy and exercise in myasthenia gravis. So I'm going to go through all of this data for you. It's primarily from a meta-analysis in 2020. So this meta-analysis uh, is considered a high level of um, research quality, which means uh, the clinicians who are undertaking a meta-analysis break down individual studies and look at the summary of them all together and kind of come to some uh, final conclusion based on those. Um, meta-analysis typically is going to filter out studies that are looking at this topic that are deemed to be unacceptable in terms of research quality, for example. So this meta-analysis, which is pretty recent, looked at the vast body of research which is out there, but only found 11 studies that attempted to answer this question. What's the benefit uh, or evidence for physical therapy in myasthenia gravis? So only 11 studies in all of the literature um, that met criteria. So overall, we can see already, there's really a lack of high quality evidence um, delving into this question in particular. And so 
Even those 11 studies that were deemed to be of sufficient enough quality to formulate some conclusion were still not the best level of research that we might expect. Um, I'll show you in a moment um, of what the different study designs are. Most of them uh, that were looked at in the meta-analysis were cohort studies. There was one prospective case control study and then only one randomized controlled trial. So just a summary briefly of the types of studies. One of the best um, studies in research to remove um, bias is a randomized controlled trial. And especially you might hear about double blind placebo controlled trial. So that's a study where there's a group of patients, they're randomized. One group is gonna go to a treatment group. One's going to go to a control group. If it's double blinded, then both the examiner and the patient don't know which group they're in. And then there's going to be some intervention and then a comparison. And um, for the best quality of evidence, usually that comparison is a placebo. And then the analysis is looked at at the end of the, the study. Other types of studies like a case control, for example, actually the events have already happened and you look back at the study retrospectively. So those tend to be considered less um, high quality because you're not randomizing patients uh, in advance um, to try and remove any biases or to randomize them based on any uh, traits that they may have, et cetera. So it's mainly looking back at your cases and then some controls and then analyzing um, retrospectively, you know, what um, risk factors, uh, for example, you might um, want to study. And then uh, finally, our, sorry about that, uh, the cohort study is um, you can have a retrospective, um, which meanings, means uh, looking back after the fact, or you can have a prospective study as well, kind of depends which direction you're doing uh, the analysis, but you have uh, patients who are all of a similar group, and then uh, some are exposed to um, the intervention that you're wanting to study and some are not and then you look at the differences between the two groups. So I'll go through, um, like I mentioned, there were 11 studies. So we'll go through kind of in um, time order, uh, some brief summary of, of each of them and what they saw. So the first one that the meta-analysis looked at is in 1998. It's a cohort study. Patients uh, underwent strength resistance training, 30 sessions for 10 weeks, and there were 11 participants. So you'll see this for each of the studies, uh, the numbers of patients usually are pretty low. And again, that's another thing we like to see to have high quality studies is higher number of patients. So all of this with the caveat that um, of those things that uh, the quality of the evidence maybe needs to be better um, with time. But regardless, uh, in this study, what was found, uh, what, what they did is do the strength training on one leg versus the other in the same patient. So knee extension strength was looked at, like what was the force that the patient could uh, exert by extending the knee and then underwent this 10 week uh, resistance training program. And they saw 23% increase in the muscle force of knee extension on the trained side compared to the untrained side. And this is all in myasthenia gravis patient. So that supports that perhaps there's evidence here that strength resistance training is very helpful. In 1998, we have a cohort study, and this is looking at respiratory training inspiratory and expiratory muscle training. So uh, training on the ability to breathe in and breathe out efficiently using all of your diaphragm strength. So um, with a physical respiratory uh, therapist in mind as the person that's directing that. It was done for 30 minutes a day, six times a week for three months, 16 participants. And they looked at these various respiratory 
uh, outcomes. So some of them are listed here, you may or may not be familiar with. Maximal inspiratory muscle pressure. So you can um, measure that with these respiratory devices as shown here. What's the pressure that the patient can exert through the machine by breathing in and by breathing out is the expiratory volume. Um, forced vital capacity or your lung capacity, and then a dyspnea index, which is kind of a rating of shortness of breath. So all of these things were noted to improve in patients uh, in the cohort that underwent this training, both in severe and moderate MG groups. That led to improvement in lung function and decreased shortness of breath. Next, in 2005, there's a randomized controlled trial. So that's great, um, but we only have 27 participants. They did inspiratory muscle training and then breathing retraining three times a week for eight weeks. That study showed improvement in the um, patients who underwent this intervention in a lot of these respiratory measurements, maximal inspiratory pressure, maximal expiratory pressure, respiratory rate, tidal volume ratio, so the total volume your lungs can breathe in, and then upper chest wall expansion and reduction. So they actually measured the chest wall, the ability um, for it to expand and go back at to normal, which is kind of a measure of what your diaphragm does. So this is again, some evidence that showing Patients with myasthenia gravis can strengthen their diaphragm by doing this respiratory muscle training and can lead to more um, efficient breathing and perhaps less shortness of breath. In 2007, there was a cohort study, respiratory endurance training, uh, where they had the patients function at 50 to 60% of their maximal voluntary ventilation. So your breathe, breathing rate. So if um, the fastest you can breathe is 100%, this was done at 50 to 60% over four to six weeks, and there were only 10 participants. But what that led to was a significant increase in respiratory endurance. So the patients were able to sustain that ventilation um, before the training for only 8.4 minutes, and then after the training for 17.1 minutes. So more respiratory endurance. And there was an increase also in the ventilatory volume. So what volume your lungs can work with uh, of bringing in and out air. That actually uh, almost doubled in these patients. In 2013, there's a randomized controlled trial. It's a respiratory muscle training that was performed by inspiratory and expiratory threshold loading methods. Uh, so again, um, working closely with a physical or respiratory therapist on um, these specific techniques. And they did a control and a sham group so sham group usually means they're kind of having them go through a fake version of this exercise instead of the real one. And uh, in our um, patients who uh, underwent the intervention, there was a, a significant improvement in the maximal inspiratory and expiratory pressure and in sniff nasal inspiratory pressure. So the sniff test is as shown in our um, patient who's, who's in this photo like the ability to breathe in very strongly through the uh, nose. So again, we're seeing improvement in uh, respiratory measurements from this training. In 2014, there's a cohort study on MG patients, one to two times weekly for 16 sessions. Balance strategy. So this is one of the few that incorporated specific balance training, which is interesting. Um, they also did some strengthening and endurance exercises. So this was a kind of a multimodal type of physical therapy that worked on all of those things. Um, and there were only seven participants. But what they did see is a greater than 15% improvement in each of the following 
after this intervention, which again is both balance, strengthening, and endurance training. And I'll show on the next slides what these uh, factors are that you may or may not have heard of. One is the QMG, the timed up and go, and the foam with eyes closed tests. So again, with this type of training, all these things improve by greater than 15% in that study. So this is the QMG, the quantitative myasthenia gravis score. Uh, many physicians are familiar with this because this is how most pharmaceutical therapies are studied. Uh, now for myasthenia gravis is one of the things they may look at as an endpoint to determine if these things are effective. So this is used a lot in research. It's really um, objective. There's a lot of detail. So usually this is just reserved for uh, research. It's not usually something that we have the ability or time to do just with the routine office visit. So some of the things that are incorporated on the QMG are assessing for double vision, ptosis, facial muscle strength, actually observing the patient, swallowing some water. Um, how long can the patient or um, how many, uh, yes, how long can the patient lift their head like up off the pillow when lying down? How long can the patient hold the arm out, hold the leg out? Um, counting aloud from one to 50, um, vital capacity is assessed hand grip, grip strength is assessed. So a very detailed, very objective measure. So I think it's a um, really reliable research tool. Timed up and go tests is a test to observe um, mobility. Uh, for this test, uh, patients should begin seated in a chair and identifying a line that's 10 feet away on the floor and then when you're ready for the patient to do it, you say, uh, go, hit the stopwatch. Patient should stand up from the chair, walk to the line at their normal pace, turn around, sit back down again. And there's uh, certain values um, that we're looking for. As listed here, an adult who takes greater than 12 seconds to complete timed up and go is at risk for falling. So um, again, this is one of the things that they were noting that were uh, improved in patients with myasthenia gravis that underwent that therapy. And remember balance um, testing was also included or balance training was included in this study. And then this is that uh, foam test that we're referring to. Patients stand on a foam pad and close their eyes. And then you have them do things like stand on one leg or stand on both legs and assessing their balance. The next study that we're looking at was in 2016. It was an MG cohort study involving progressive resistance training or aerobic training for 20 sessions over eight weeks. There were just 15 participants. And uh, what they noted was improvement in the MGQOL 15, which is a quality of life score as well as a stair climb functional measures. And that improved in the resistance group compared to the aerobic group. So I thought that was pretty interesting that actually it's the resistance training group that had these benefits in, and specifically in MG patients. And I'll show you, I believe on an upcoming slide, what the MGQOL 15 uh, consists of exactly. And the next study was in 2017, a cohort study consisted of 75 minutes twice weekly for 12 weeks, supervised physical therapy consisting of aerobic activity, muscle resistance and strength training, only 10 participants. But they saw statistically significant improvement after this intervention in the following. So CMAP amplitude. That's one of the things you may be familiar with if you've had nerve conduction study or EMG. Uh, that is that electrical test to take measurements of your nerve and muscle. And when we stimulate the nerve and we record over a muscle, that is the CMAP, compound muscle action potential. So that's uh, in, listed as a voltage. So um, it's actually the voltage that you're seeing 
conduct from the muscle. And that whole pathway from the nerve to the neuromuscular junction to the muscle has to be intact for you to have a normal voltage there. So they actually, after this intervention, saw an improvement in the voltage that the muscles were able to generate, both in the biceps of the arm and in the rectus femoris or the thigh. So that's great. We, we can see like physiologically that the muscles seem to be changing and improving. There also were functional measurements that improved in these participants in terms of six minute walk tests. So how far can you walk in six minutes? And then the weight on that patients are physically able to curl with their biceps or extend with their leg. So this is what I was referring to, the MGQOL15. It's a quality of life measurement. I think this is uh, helpful for patients with myasthenia gravis, maybe to have a tool to discuss with your doctor. Um, some of the things um, listed here may not be as apparent when like we're doing our physical exam. So we're only seeing a snapshot of what you look like at that moment. So it's good to know uh, when discussing with your doctor how your myasthenia gravis is affecting your life. And some of the things listed here, um, it might be helpful to track, like to have a discussion point, for example. So things uh, included on this scale and it's zero means not at all and four is a lot. How frustrated are you with your MG? Do you have trouble using your eyes? Do you have trouble eating? Have you limited your social activity because of MG? Does MG limit ability to enjoy hobbies, fun activities? Do you have trouble meeting the needs of your family? Do you have to make plans around your MG? How does it affect your job? Um, speaking, driving, do you feel depressed about MG? Have trouble walking, getting around public places, feeling overwhelmed, grooming. So uh, this, again, this measurement had improved in the patients that underwent that um, resistance training physical therapy um, for eight weeks. And then uh, in 2018, these studies that were listed here were done. The first one is a case control study looking at long-term respiratory muscle endurance training. Four weeks intensive, meaning five 30-minute sessions per week, followed by 12 months maintenance. And then five by 30-minute sessions over two weeks and 23 participants. They saw significant improvement in the respiratory endurance or time until exhaustion by 412%, improvement in squats per minute by 160%, and improvement in breathing patterns at rest with prolonged expiration by 122%. So this one, the physical activity is resulting in improvements both with the endurance of physical activity, but also breathing. Uh, the next one is a cohort study, 12 weeks of a supervised physical therapy regimen, aerobic and resistance training, 11 participants. With this training program, they saw improvement in the action potential from the rectus femoris. So again, that CMAP, the voltage coming from the muscle that they were looking at, uh, the muscle force, and actually the thickness on the muscle when checked on ultrasound as well. And then improvements in the MG composite score. So it's a slightly different MG scale that was looked at there. I believe I have on the upcoming slide. And then an improvement in the 30 second chair stand test. And then finally, uh, in 2018, another cohort study was done, 10 week physical therapy. And then what's unique to that study is they also looked at psychological interventions. So um, not just physical therapy, but psychological therapy was incorporated into that study. And that was for um, 10 participants. And they saw an improvement in what's known as the visual analog fatigue scale. And I'll show that on an upcoming slide. So this one is the MGC or MG composite scale. Uh, I do this one on my patients for every office visit. In addition to the MG ADL, MG composite 
it has both subjective or like questions that you ask the patient and objective measurements on it. So I think it's good to kind of get a uh, big picture. So uh, for example, there's some exam findings on here, looking for ptosis, uh, observing for double vision when the patient looks laterally, eye closure strength, and then um, asking the patient about any slurred speech, chewing difficulty, swallowing difficulty, breathing difficulty, and then checking neck strength, uh, shoulder abduction, and hip flexion strength. And that 30 second chair stand that they were referring to is um, where we have the patient seated upright in a chair with their arms crossed and then timing, having the patient um, come to a full standing position, sit back down and repeating this for 30 seconds. And according to the score here, depending on your age and your gender, if you're below that threshold, then that would indicate a risk for falls. And visual analog fatigue scale, uh, these are different ways of assessing patient's fatigue. Fatigue can be such a multifactorial thing. And uh, in myasthenia gravis, um, you know, we typically think fatigue is muscle fatigue, but um, it, it can be described in different ways by different uh, patients. So as mentioned here, um, patients kind of score, how do they feel either not at all or completely for each of the following things. So tired, sleepy, drowsy, fatigued, worn out, energetic, active, vigorous, efficient, lively, bushed, exhausted, keeping your eyes open, moving your body, concentrating, carry on a conversation, uh, no desire to close your eyes, no desire to lie down um, or desire to do those things. And so I think that kind of incorporates both physical fatigue and emotional fatigue. Um, and that can be um, interesting looking at the whole picture. And like we mentioned in the um, intervention, which was including both physical and psychological therapy, there was improvement in that score. So in summary, um, we wish we had more data. Uh, we had uh, only two randomized controlled trials, one case control, and eight cohort study um, in the literature. And this was already uh, literature which was filtered down uh, in this meta-analysis. Um, so even, even then, um, it remains, um, you know, it's lacking a bit. So across all of these studies, there's only really 166 participants in total. So having the number of patients for these studies also is um, a factor. Um, but that being said, uh, there still were improvements in various things with these interventions. So functional ability, muscle force, seen with both super supervised and home-based physical therapy. That was primarily seen with the strengthening and resistive physical training. There were improved lung volumes and capacity in individuals with myasthenia gravis with respiratory muscle training. So learn that we actually can strengthen the diaphragm by doing respiratory exercises in MG. Uh, balance training in MG can be helpful in reducing risk of falls. And that rehabilitative approaches that may be combined with psychological support can reduce fatigue and improve quality of life. Caveats to this, um, we talked about some already, but one is that most of the studies did not mention what was the diagnostic criteria used. So how were these patients confirmed to have myasthenia gravis? That's one thing we need to know to make sure we're looking at all the same type of patient. And also what's their um, myasthenia gravis classification? So you may know that there's an MGFA classification of one through five, depending how severe the disease is. Not all patients are exactly the same and it might be helpful to know when we're looking at these interventions, what's the severity of their myasthenia gravis to begin with. And then as I mentioned, the studies were small and there's somewhat lack of high quality evidence. So I think conclusions that we can make, one is that, yes, high intensity physical activity theoretically could increase muscle weakness in MG. Um, however, the evidence shows benefits of physical training. Aerobic strength and resistance training 
which is progressive. So starting at a lower level and building up gradually. Um, there are evidence um, that it's going to improve aerobic um, and strength um, act, uh, abilities in mild to moderate myasthenia gravis. There's no evidence that physical therapy actually leads to worsening of disease. And when all of these studies were looking at myasthenia gravis specifically and not all neuromuscular diseases as a group. And respiratory training in particular was one thing to me that really stood out in these studies as being effective, managing fatigable weakness and managing respiratory failure. And there's benefits for both respiratory endurance and physical performance with this type of training. So in general, we know that there are additional benefits of physical therapy and exercise. So as we train our respiratory muscle, then our respiratory rate just at um, rest uh, lowers and decreases naturally. And that puts less strain on your um, breathing, your heart and your lungs uh, over time during physical activity. So that in over time improves your physical fitness in general. Exercise increases your bone density. That's really important um, as we get older and especially uh, if patients are already on things, medications, for example, that are gonna put you at risk for reduced bone density, such as steroids, um, doing some weight bearing exercise to increase your bone density can be very helpful. Um, building musculoskeletal mass uh, can also increase the mitochondria within muscles. So your muscles actually adapt uh, with this activity and get better. Um, exercise can increase the ability of muscles to cope with fatigue. So that can improve your strength and endurance. And then the balance training that we mentioned um, in a couple of these uh, studies that can lead to prevention of falls. So uh, retraining your vestibular system, which is really important for your balance uh, to prevent falls. So where to start? One, we want to make sure patients are doing this safely. So it's always better to start at lower impact and gradually building up. So low impact activities might include walking, swimming, or stationary bike. Uh, you can start under physical therapy guidance and, and, and supervision. As I mentioned, I'm not the physical therapist, but I send patients to physical therapy. I always defer to them on what specifically are the exercises needed for that patient and how long are they going to undergo those activities. So listen to your physical therapist. So if you uh, start exercise under the guidance of the expert, then I think you're setting yourself up better for safety rather than just trying to jump into it on your own if you have not uh, done activities like that in a while. Uh, proper supportive shoes, level surfaces are important to prevent falls. If you already have weakness, you may be more at risk for falls. So do everything you can to prevent that. And then I think the number one important thing is to listen to your body, to take breaks. It's like we said, we're trying to balance, like we know from all this data, everything I presented to you that we're going to condition our muscles and build up strength better and better slowly over time that actually can improve your endurance and uh, improve the fatigue that's seen in my senior gravis. But on the other hand, we said that in this disease, um, you know, with more activity, you can get weaker. So it's, it's always a balance between those things. So listen to your body. You know, if you're getting to that point where you're having uh, really fatigue in your muscles, slow down, take breaks, et cetera. Make sure you properly warm up and cool down. That can help with that. Make sure you're properly hydrated and perhaps plan around MG medications. So if a patient is on um, pyridostigmine, for example, and they know they get a boost from that, they're able to um, have some more strength and activity temporarily, that might be something to help you to be able to exercise. I think having an exercise buddy is a good idea, especially if you're not doing under the guidance of physical therapy, if you're doing a little bit of exercise on your own. One, having a buddy kind of holds you accountable uh, to make sure you're keeping up with your plan, but also to make sure you're safe and that they can observe you and uh, keep you out of harm's way. And then adaptive equipment. So patients who um, might need um, special uh, equipment to be able to do certain exercises, 
think about that. Um, so for example, um, like a stationary bike might be a good idea because it's better than perhaps going on a bike and riding on the street because then you know you have to worry about your balance and this is something that kind of removes um, that issue. So that's all I had. I put my resources on the slide too, but thank you for joining me today and I'll take any questions. Thank you so much. We'll get into the questions now. Um, this first one is, if you need a surgical procedure, such as a knee or a hip replacement, should you do PT prior to and after the procedure? And then if so, to what level? Meaning push exercise or slow and steady? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, and that alludes to that not all physical therapy is the same. And I know when I write physical therapy orders for patient, I try to be pretty specific about what we want. So the type of things that we're, we talked about that um, are shown to actually lead to improvements in overall conditioning in myasthenia gravis, like your respiratory training, your progressive strength training, um, that is going to be different than rehabbing a knee. So when you go in for after an, a knee surgery, for example, they're really going to focus on strengthening the muscles around that joint, having you do specific exercises to build that up and perhaps just balance and make sure you're walking safely. So I think those would be two very different types of physical therapy and they'd have to be written for pretty specifically what you are trying to accomplish and, you know, communicating with your doctor and your physical therapist about that. And that, yes, perhaps it, you could benefit from that both before your procedure and after in slightly different ways. Thank you. This next one, is there training to help strengthen eye muscles? Oh, that's a good question. I think eye muscles are one of the toughest things in my senior gravis. It's like the first thing to happen. And then one of the toughest things to treat, um, even like medication wise and things like that, uh, just because your eye muscles are so heavily active throughout the day. And you know, when you're talking about neuromuscular junction disease, it's the most active muscles that tend to be effective. Um, so I don't, uh, I'm not aware of any studies that looked specifically at the eye muscles. I presented to you the data that was out there. Um, I didn't see anything like that. That being said, I think theoretically it might work the same way of um, progressively trying to train and strengthen these muscles. That might be something you can try to do on your own. Um, I'm not sure if physical therapy would um, have much advice on that. I've not seen that before, but certainly uh, worth discussing. For MGQOL15, how do you differentiate the effect on some of the measurements due to the MG meds versus MG itself? Yeah, that's a very valid point as well. I think um, just if you're going through your MGQOL to try and see where you land on that, just answer it honestly as to what you're feeling for each of those metrics. And it's to be used as a discussion point as well. If you believe some of the things that you're noticing that are affecting your quality of life are due to your medication, um, then, you know, the intervention on that uh, is going to be very different when you discuss uh, with your doctor, like a plan going forward. So absolutely, MG can cause certain things that affect your quality of life and medications have side effects too. But yeah, just be honest with that and use it as a discussion point. Can a CPAP machine be used for respiratory therapy during the day? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question as well. I mean, if you have had a sleep study and usually if you're determined to have obstructive sleep apnea, that may or may not be tied into the MG with your diaphragm weakness, you may benefit from a CPAP. Um, CPAP, however, it means that a machine is doing some work for you. It's providing a positive airway pressure to um, keep your um, breathing going. Um, and so that you don't want um, to get apnea, which means that you temporary, temporarily stop breathing, especially when you sleep at night, is then that can lead to lack of oxygen and all sorts of problems. So it, 
CPAP machines, I think, are a necessary intervention for people that they've been prescribed to. But I wouldn't think of that necessarily as a form of physical therapy. I think physical therapy is more of training your muscles to do this type of breathing work on your own. It requires a little bit of effort. This next question, is respiratory therapy done by the physical therapist or another specialist? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I, like I said, I learned some of this as I was uh, doing uh, the research. It seemed primarily that it was done from the physical therapy department where all of these studies were done, but it may just depend on how things are arranged, where you live and what hospital system and how each physical therapy department is set up. It might live under just physical therapy or they might have a separate respiratory therapy department. But either way, if you um, your doctor can specify exactly what they're looking for on the order, I think we can get it to the right place. Great. Is there a place to register to be involved in future studies about physical therapy or muscle training with MG? Yeah, that's a good question as well. We're always looking for patients who are interested in research. I think it ends up being hard to connect people wanting to do the research and the patients. Um, I might actually defer to you, Jenna, if you have any resources uh, that the MGFA has, but I, in general, um, for my patients, recommend going to clinicaltrials.gov. So that is the um, like government research site for everything actually in the world. And if you type in uh, under clinicaltrials.gov some certain keywords, myasthenia gravis and physical therapy, for example, you'll get a list of all these ongoing trials. You could filter by ones that are recruiting or for geographic area. And then for each of those studies, they'll have on there a coordinator that you can just contact. So that would be my most like specific suggestion, how to get involved. You can always ask your specific doctor as well if they're aware of any um, trials going on at their institution. But it's, it seems like it's just not done very often for this topic in general. Yeah, that's the approach we would suggest too. Um, if we do get notifications about any of them, we'll send out information as we receive it as well. Um, this next question is, would you recommend PT for almost all patients with mild to moderate generalized MG with weakness? Yeah, I think so. I think that um, one, if you feel your disease is under good control. So um, we don't want anybody who's we're like, we're going up and down and their meds are in and out of the hospital. Maybe that's not the time to be doing your physical therapy. But if um, you're getting to that point where you know, the meds are kind of um, at a stable level, but you still have some weakness, you want to see if that can improve. That's the perfect time to go to physical therapy. I mention it and discuss with all my MG patients. Um, some patients are not interested because they're already super active and they do things on their own and they go to the gym. But uh, sometimes if you are needing that extra guidance, it's absolutely worth a try. Thank you. This next question is, how can you find a PT that knows about MG? That's tough, yeah. Um, at my institution, uh, we have a dedicated uh, physical therapy department and we have a big neurology center and also a big physical medicine and rehab department. And we all send patients to the same PT. So I am I know when I send patients there that at least the physical therapist is going to be familiar with neurological diseases. That's number one. Sometimes they're not familiar with MG or neurology at all. So I think it, you know to call around or maybe check on the website as if how familiar these facilities are in dealing with neurology patients, number one. And that would be my first suggestion. Thank you. This next question is, can we do physical exercise during a flare up for a week now? I'm unable to walk. So it is. So is it advisable to just do a little exercise from bed itself? 
Yeah, that's that's the balance. That's the tricky part that comes in that when you are in a flare up, you're going to see perhaps every time you try to do that physical activity, you feel that it makes it a bit worse. Um, so you have to go really slow in that case. Um, I think if you can do a little bit um, if you if it's really bad situation, like you said, you're in bed, at least stretching range of motion, prevent contractures, prevent that pain from being sedentary, a little bit of that type of exercise is good, but you have to listen to your body. Uh, this next question is, does occupational therapy have any role for assisting MG symptoms? Yeah, I, I kind of think of occupational therapy and physical therapy being a little bit different. Physical therapy is more looking for broad physical gains that we're trying to make, whereas occupational therapy is trying to help patients uh, do certain tasks. So that's what they're aiming for. Like, uh, can we get you to do some a certain occupation? Like, there, it's a little, maybe a lot more nuanced, and especially um, pa patients that have issues with their hands, uh, occupational therapists tend to work for... Um, uh, work with a lot as well. So perhaps both depends on what your needs are. Um, all of the studies that I looked at here seem to be more uh, physical therapy uh, oriented rather than occupational. Thank you. Uh, what MG related breathing equipment can be used with a respiratory crisis? Mm. That's a good question as well. So I'm not a respiratory or physical therapist, um, so I don't manage those things exactly, but I have seen patients have, there's something called an incentive spirometer. So uh, that's actually very commonly, like if you were hospitalized, something at the bedside, a little device with a ball in it that you can breathe in and breathe out and you can see how far the ball moves and that's how you know you're uh, breathing into the extent of your lung capacity. So incentive spirometer is one uh, device that I'm familiar with that I believe might help. But again, I have to defer the rest of that to people that have a bit more specific expertise. Thank you. Um, are there tongue and mouth muscle exercises? Hmm. Yeah, same, same thing. I did not see anything like that specifically in the um, analysis that I was looking at, but I would think that analogously, same idea. Like there does seem to be evidence uh, in MG specifically that muscles can uh, strengthen, they can adapt, they can be conditioned with time, with a gradual um, increase in this type of activity. Um, but how to specifically advise on how to exercise those muscles, I again would have to defer to physical therapist um, colleagues. Thank you. Uh, this is a comment. I have been doing a supervised exercise program for 19 months, three times a week, with an exercise therapist and can attest to the benefits of the physical activity. I think that exercising all of your muscles to some extent makes a big difference. Yeah, that's awesome that you're, you're probably seeing the benefits of the conditioning your muscle, adapting, building up the muscle, all of those long-term things um, that were reinforced in those, those studies. That's awesome. And then um, one more question. Are there any exercises that one can do to get going in the morning. It's difficult to get out of bed most mornings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, specific um, exercises, again, I, I would have to defer to the physical therapy uh, colleagues, um, but it, some of it of, of just um, the stretching range of motion uh, things that I mentioned can help with perhaps stiffness that has set in from being like perhaps sedentary overnight. But yeah, that might be worth um, a consult with physical therapist to get something more specific. Thank you so much, Dr. Christman. Um, that's all the time we have for today. I um, just wanted to remind everybody that this session will be available to reference back to after um, it's posted on the MGFA website. So you can certainly look back at the slides if you want to. And I want to thank you again for your time today and for joining us. And thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Thanks, everyone.